Let's pray together before we begin. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace and your goodness made known to us through Jesus Christ, and we ask now that you would speak to us through him who is the living word. Open our minds and hearts that we, we might understand you more and live for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, t- we finish now today the last installment of a year-long study of the story of Jesus. Most recently, we've been in a series called The Return of the King, looking at the images of Jesus in the book of Revelation. Now, I've told you this before, but Revelation is an interesting study, and we've talked about what it's not. Revelation is not a method by which we predict the end of the world. It wasn't given to us for that purpose. Apocalyptic literature in the Bible is not to help us predict the end of the world, but to reveal to us the one who holds the end of the world in his hands, namely Jesus Christ. Revelation 1.7 says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. For some of you, that makes you more secure and you're like that. Others of you get a little uncomfortable and you'd like to hear more about the beast and the antichrist and the tribulation and how it's all going to wind down. But today I want to talk to you about the image of Jesus Christ as our judge. One of the most compelling and troubling images in all of the book of Revelation, even all the Bible. How many of you like watching courtroom dramas on TV? Law and order, that kind of thing? I know that I do. I enjoy watching the investigation side of things and how they put a case together. And of course, I love watching when some uh, guilty defendant uh, is pronounced and sentenced by the judge. But if I'm honest, I don't like courtrooms all that much, at least not personally. Maybe this goes back to the fact that I spent some time in traffic court as a teenager and as an adult and with my son when he got his license. Even as a character witness for a friend in a trial once, I sat in a courtroom and just going through the whole ordeal, being there, even though I wasn't on trial, made me so nervous and uncomfortable. I think there's a part of each one of us that fears the idea of being put on trial. We are uncomfortable with the idea of being under examination. We're anxious about being questioned, cross-examined by the bar of justice, and eventually maybe even having sentence pronounced on us. It's no surprise that the Bible has something to say about these things about what we sometimes refer to in pop culture as Judgment Day. What comes into your mind when you hear that phrase, Judgment Day? Terminator movies? Crazy end-of-the-world theories? Street corner preachers? I think that, as I said, popular culture has so influenced our thinking about Judgment Day that we're in danger of misunderstanding badly what the Bible actually has to say. The idea of a day of judgment is not just a Uh, It's not popular or comfortable, and it's not just a way for Christians to talk about uh, keeping in line. Nevertheless, the Bible is very clear on this point. And the first thing I want you to know is that there will be a day of judgment. There will be a day of judgment for all of us. The whole of the Bible, not just the book of Revelation, makes this abundantly clear. In Acts chapter 17, verse 31, we read these words. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Did you catch that? God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. There will be a day of judgment. Romans chapter 2, verse 16 says something very similar about this day. On that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Once again, there is a specific day which God has fixed to judge the world and everyone in it. Now, I have a good friend who's a pastor of a more liberal denomination, and from time to time we talk, and he has moved far away from where I am theologically. He denies the idea of judgment or hell or eternity for that matter. And he said to me once that judgment day is really just a Christian version of wait till your father gets home, to keep Christians in line, to make us all do the right thing, fear tactics, if you will. But the Bible is very clear. God has set a day in which he will judge the world. And we ignore this biblical truth at our peril. I avoid preaching on it at my peril and at yours as well. Quite frankly, when Pastor Brian and I laid out this series and I realized he was going to get to preach on Jesus as the bridegroom and I was going to have to preach on Jesus as the judge, I thought I'd gotten the short end of the stick. But it's not true. It's in here for a reason. To warn us and as we'll see, to comfort us as well. It's for our good. At the Mount St. Helens Visitor Center, perhaps some of you have been there, there is a a story in that visitor center about a man named Harry Randall Truman. Some of you might know about Harry Randall Truman. 
He was the caretaker of the cabin and resort at Spirit Lake at the base of Mount St. Helens. And despite all the geological warnings and all the scientists saying different, he refused to believe the mountain would ever harm him, and so he would not leave his home. In fact, he was kind of a pop culture icon at the time, interviewed on TV and written about. And today, Spirit Lake, Harry Randall Truman's cabin, and Harry Randall Truman himself are buried under more than 200 feet of debris and ash from that terrible eruption in 1980. The point is, we ignore these warnings and these truths at our peril. It's foolish and it really changes nothing. So let's make some important observations from Scripture about this day of judgment which God has fixed. First, Jesus Christ will be the judge. There will be a day of judgment and Jesus Christ will be the judge. God has set a day and God has appointed a judge. John chapter 5 verses 21 to 23 make this even more clear for us. This is Jesus' words in John 5. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Two things to see in that verse. Number one, God has given all judgment to the Son. Number two, just as the Father gives life, so the Son gives life. Because the Son has the, has the power and authority to give life, He has the power and authority to judge. And God, the Father, has given all judgment to the Son. So God has fixed a day, appointed a day of judgment, and God has appointed a judge, Jesus Christ. My friend is a criminal defense attorney, and he talks to me about how young lawyers who uh, come into trial law uh, spend a lot of time on the evidence, which is important. They spend a lot of time on building an argument and jury selection, also very important. He says, what most lawyers don't learn until after a few trials are under their belt is that the most important thing in any trial is not the evidence, not the jury selection, not how you build an argument, but the judge. He said, knowing the judge is so important. The judge's temperament, the judge's character, the judge's past rulings, the judge's leanings and, and likely, uh, likelihood to rule in a certain way based on their history. Now, if Jesus Christ is to be your judge, then wouldn't it be wise for you to know him, to know his character, to know his temperament, to know what he cares about and what he wants with you. He, Jesus Christ, is the perfect judge. He is fully God. That means he's holy and just and righteous. There's no chance that he could get it wrong or be bribed or have an off day in his reasoning or judgments. He's also fully man, which means He's like us. He understands our condition, yet he was without sin. As John 5, says, as the Father gives life, so does the Son. This fully God and fully man, perfect man, is the only one fit to judge. And number three, before this perfect judge, we will all have to give an account. So God has appointed a day, God has appointed a judge, and on that day, before that judge, Jesus Christ, will all give an account of our lives. Now, I think both Christians and non-Christians often get this wrong. Non-Christians, like my friend, sometimes think, well, there's no such thing really as Judgment Day. That's just stuff in the Bible added over time by the church to scare people, but it's not really true. Christians sometimes make the mistake of believing that there's a Judgment Day, but it's not for me. I'm forgiven, and so I don't have to give an account of my life. Both are wrong. Both of them are wrong. Romans 14, verse 12 says, So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Paul wrote that, and who's he writing to? Christians in Rome. He's saying to believers, those who trust in Jesus Christ, each of us will have to give an account of himself to God. We'll all stand before this judgment seat. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, spells this out in a little more detail. Let me read it for you. The Apostle Paul says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Again, Paul's writing to Christians here saying each of us will stand before the judgment seat to give an account of everything in our lives. And it will not matter, matter on that day whether we believe in him or not. 
There's no Muslim judgment seat and Hindu judgment seat and Buddhist judgment seat. There's only the judgment seat of Christ. And every person will stand before him. In fact, I was thinking about this. In the greatest reversal perhaps in all of history, one day Pontius Pilate will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of himself on that day. And on that day, Jesus will not be silent. He'll have something to say to Pilate. Now, Christians tend to think that because their sins are all forgiven in Christ, which they are, that they sort of get a pass on this day, that there's no account to be given of their lives. That's not so. This is commonly missed or misunderstood. Just because we're not saved by our works does not mean we do not give an account of our works. So the Bible's clear in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. We are not saved by our works. We're saved by grace through faith, and it's not of ourselves, not by works of righteousness, so no one would boast. But that does not mean we will not give an account of our works. We will not be held accountable for our lives. C.S. Lewis writes about this in an essay called The World's Last Night. It's a lesser-known essay uh, book, and I I would commend it to you, but let me read to you what he says. Our ancestors had a habit of using the word judgment in this context as if it only simply meant punishment. Hence the popular expression, it's a judgment on him or her. I believe we can sometimes render the thing more vivid to ourselves by taking the judgment in a stricter sense as in the sense of a verdict. Someday, and what if this present day were the world's last night? An absolutely correct verdict, if you like, a perfect verdict will be passed on what each of us is. We have all all encountered judgments or verdicts on ourselves in this life. Every now and then we discover what our fellow creatures really think of us. I don't, of course, mean what they tell us to our faces. That we usually have to discount. I am thinking of what we sometimes overhear by accident or of the opinions about us which our neighbors or employees or subordinates unknowingly reveal. Such discoveries can be the bitterest or sweetest experiences we have. Did you catch what Lewis said there? Sometimes we accidentally discover what our friends or or people that are close to us really think of us. They they don't mean to reveal it to us, but we, we read an email, we see a text, or we overhear them, and we discover. And that can be either the most bitter or most sweet experience. He goes on to say, But of course, the bitter and the sweet are limited by our doubts as to the wisdom of those who judge. We always hope that those who so clearly think us cowards or bullies are ignorant and malicious. We always fear that those who trust us or admire us are partially misled. I suppose the experience of final judgment, which may break in upon us at any moment, will be like these little experiences, but magnified by infinity." In other words, when you find out that someone you know and trust thinks poorly of you, you think, well, they don't really know me. They're wrong. They don't really know me. When you find out that someone you know and trust thinks well of you, there's a part of you that thinks, well, they don't really know me. I'm not as good as they think I am. Lewis is saying, we will on that last day, all of us, have the truth about who we are revealed laid bare. And there'll be no no way to say, well, you don't really know me, Jesus, because he does. He knows you perfectly. Lewis goes on to say, I do not find that pictures of physical catastrophe, signs in the clouds, heavens roll up like a scroll, help me so much as the naked idea of judgment. We cannot always be excited, but we can perhaps train ourselves to ask more and more often how the thing which we are saying or doing or failing to do at any moment will look when the irresistible light of heaven streams in upon it. For it will be an infallible judgment. If it is favorable, we shall have no fear. If it is unfavorable, no hope that it is wrong. We shall not only believe, we shall know, know beyond any doubt in every fiber of our appalled or delighted being that as the judge has said, so we are neither more nor less nor other. As usual, Lewis says things better than I can. On that day, the day which God has appointed, we'll face the judge he has appointed, Jesus Christ, and we'll give an account of our lives, and the judgment that comes back to us will be perfect, without flaw. The Bible says that God removes our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. 
and he remembers them no more. That's true. And we cling to that promise as Christians. But it is talking about our salvation. God does not count those sins against, against us ultimately. But our lives, the quality of our lives and the things that we do for ourselves or for God will someday be brought to light. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 through 15. Let me read them for you again. The Apostle Paul writing to Christians. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Now that's a very strange and interesting passage. The Apostle Paul is saying, we're going to give an account of ourselves and our work's going to be examined. Some of our work will be burned up because it wasn't worth eternal value. Others of our work will, will survive. And then he says, for those of us that have our work burned up, we'll suffer loss. What's the loss we'll suffer? What's he talking about there? I think it's the loss of regret. I think it's the loss of, of missed opportunity to bring more glory to Christ in his kingdom. Missed chances to share the gospel or serve somebody in his name or use our influence to bless someone else. As my role as a pastor, I sometimes am with families uh, when death is near in hospitals or at homes. And I remember as an on-call chaplain at Delanor many, a couple of years ago, I got called to a family who's not from our church and I walked in the room and the father was there in the bed with his wife and two sons. They didn't have much of a church home to speak of and no pastor to call and so they called the chaplain on call, which was me. And their father and her husband died while I was in that room. It was very difficult and painful. First Thessalonians 4, chapter 4, verse 13, the Apostle Paul says, we do not grieve like those who have no hope. There's a different character to the grief of those who trust in Christ, and that was sort of missing in that room. After I helped the family call a funeral home and make some arrangements and prayed with them, one of the sons of this man who died came over to me and said, with tears in his eyes, with a shaking voice, I was here two months ago. If I would have known that was the last time I would see my father, I would have said this and apologized for that and done things differently. I think that's kind of close to the regret Paul's talking about. Suffering loss. Like, if only I'd have known that relationship or that opportunity to share or that moment or that time when I wasn't as generous as I could have been, if only I'd have known what was at stake, I would have done it differently. We'll all give an account even those of us who have had all our sin forgiven by Christ. Next, the judgment will be comprehensive, just, and final. So God has appointed a day. God has appointed a judge. We're all going to stand before that judge. And when he judges us, his judgment, his verdict, will be comprehensive, just, and final. There's no appeals process, in other words, because there's no higher court to appeal to. There is no missing evidence. Nothing will be discovered later at a later date that can be brought to get us off or make our sentence less. It'll be a perfect judgment. And here we come now to the book of Revelation, which spells out this judgment day in vivid detail in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Let me read them for you. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And this is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That's a, a vivid and troubling image there of judgment day. Several important images inside this passage. There's a white throne, a great white throne. There are books and a book. There's a lake of fire. We'll try to get to most of these images as we go. 
First of all, books. Before the great white throne, which is the judgment seat of Christ, there are books. Well, what are the books? Well, I have here a stack of some of my moleskin journals. These, these are, uh, you can't come read these later. These represent your life. There's a book for every person who's ever lived. The book of your life. Probably much thicker than this, but you get the idea. And each of us will have a book that will represent our, everything we've thought, said, done, not done while living on life on this earth. And when we stand before the great white throne, our book will be opened. It will be examined. We'll give an account of ourselves based on what's in the book. All of us. The books will be opened, and each one, Revelation says, will be judged according to what's in them. There's also another book, singular, the book of life, early in Revelation 3, called the Lamb's Book of Life. This is not the actual book of life. This is an exhaustive concordance, which I recovered, so you can't look up your name in here. But the point is, on the day of judgment, there will also be another book, just a massive record of names of who belongs to Christ. And this will also be opened, and the names will be searched out. You get in the image here? It's a powerful image for us. Everything recorded, everything brought to light, the only question on that day will be, is this all you have? On the day of judgment, the question is, is all you have your own works, your own life? Because if it is, if this is all you have when you stand before Christ, you're in serious trouble. Friends, the Bible's clear. If all you have to give an account of yourself is what you've done and not done and said and not said, it's not enough. Your soul is in danger. Jonathan Edwards once gave a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. If you've not read it, I guess you've probably heard that title before. I don't think that would be a very popular title of a sermon today. In his sermon, he talks about sinners hanging by on a knife's edge to fall off one side or the other of the precipice to life or death. There's even records of people fainting and passing out while he preached for fear, awaiting their judgment. His style, Edwards, is offensive to our contemporary sensibilities. He would not be a popular preacher today. But he's right. He's right. God has appointed a day. God has appointed a judge. We will all stand before that judge, and the judgment will be comprehensive, just, and final. It'll be a hard day for all of us. For some of us, though, it'll be just a day. Our, our eternity will not be regret and suffering loss. It'll be a day, a moment of, of regret and missed opportunity, and then we'll be caught up with him in his grace and love and glory for eternity. But for others... That sense of fear and regret will be the beginning of an eternity of that. Again, I don't like talking about it, but I avoid it. You ignore it at your own peril. My friend I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon who's a, a, bit, a bit liberal and doesn't really believe in literal judgment or literal hell, he once asked me as well, you don't really believe there's an actual lake of fire, Jeff, do you? I mean, you don't really believe it smells like sulfur and there's real flames. I mean, come on. I said, no, I don't believe it. It's probably a literal fire. And he looked relieved. And then I told him, I think it's probably a metaphor for something far worse. He didn't look quite as relieved then. Friends, there's a day of judgment. There's a judge, Jesus Christ. We're all going to stand before him and give an account, and his judgment will be perfect. Are you ready for some good news now? I mean, after all this, are you ready for some good news? Here it is. Your judge is also your redeemer. This is the beauty of the gospel. The one before whom you will one day stand to give an account of your life is also the one who has already stood in your place. It's no accident that Jesus was put to death after a trial. He faced a trial. He who was perfect and sinless was tried and condemned by wicked, sinful men. So that you and I, wicked, sinful people, might be pronounced forgiven and free. He's already stood in your place. The image is this. On that day, judgment day, when the book of your life is opened and you give an account of yourself and then the book is opened and your name is found to belong to Jesus, that means that Jesus, the judge, comes off the bench, takes off his robe, stands right next to you and says, this one belongs to me. 
This one I've covered and forgiven. That's the message of the gospel. So the only question on that day is going to be, which book? The book of your life or the book of life? The Bible's crystal clear about this. When I was giving this sermon last week at the East Campus, I had a friend, dear friend who I know well and who has come to Christ after many years said to me, called out in the middle of the service, how do you get your name in the Lamb's Book of Life? And if you haven't gotten it until now, let me tell you. It's really very simple. You come to the place where you say, I know that my life does not measure up to your standard God. I know that if this is all I have, I'm in trouble. I know that I'm full of sin and corruption. Even in my best day, I fall short. And so I surrender my heart to you. I ask you to be not just my judge, but my redeemer, my forgiver, and my savior. And I want you to help me live my life for your glory. If you're willing to do that, there's no magic words, there's no hocus pocus about it. If you in the sincerest place in your heart mean that and want Jesus to forgive you, come into your life and forgive you, and you turn over your life to him, he will. He does. Friends, if, if all you know is Jesus as your judge, and by the way, it's possible to be in church your whole life and never understand that he's also your redeemer. If you only know him as your judge, how sad and tragic. It breaks his heart. It's my prayer for all of us that you would know, not just this day, but on that day, your judge also wants to be your redeemer. Let's pray. God, I thank you for everybody here and for those that are going to hear this sermon, that you would speak to their hearts, that they would know not, that because of what you have already accomplished at the cross, there does not have to be fear, panic, anxiety, or desperation on that day. God, for those that are here who already know you by faith and have been forgiven, remind us that we too will give an account of our lives, and we want everything we do to be for your glory. For those here who do not yet know you, God, let them know that you want to redeem them, that they would belong to you, and their name will be written on your heart forever. We thank you, Jesus, and we praise you in your name. Amen.